Hi everybody, this is lecture 8.1, uh, heterosexual deviance. Uh, we will be talking about uh, sexual deviance in this context, but uh, restricted to the realm of when se men have sex with women and vice versa. Uh, we will be talking about non-heterosexual sexual deviance in following uh, lectures. So when we talk about heterosexual deviance, we will be talking about deviant sex. We will be talking about sex work, and we may touch on sexual harassment. So first, let's talk about what it means to talk about sex that is deviant. So uh, there are uh, wide scopes of sexual activity that are considered, quote, normal and not normal. Uh, the least deviant sex being when a man and a woman uh, have sex with each other. Uh, in times past, it was when a man and a woman who are married have sex with each other. Uh, largely, in our society as it exists, it is not seen as being deviant when two non-married people have sex with each other. Uh, but it is still considered deviant when two teens, have uh, male and female, have uh, sex with each other. Uh, there are a lot of misconceptions about how teen sex often works. Um, it is true that boys with high self-esteem are more likely to engage in premarital sex than uh, boys with lower self-esteem, uh, while girls with high self-esteem are more likely to not have sex. Uh, and a lot of that is tied up with patriarchal uh, examples given in our society namely uh, boys that feel great about themselves think they deserve sex while girls that feel great about themselves feel that they uh, don't need to have sex. Uh, sex education uh, promoting abstinence has been met with limited success and uh, the kind of sex education offered in high schools does uh, vary greatly. It can go from abstinence only, so saying you should never have sex and this is why, uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But also, uh, it uh, is talk. There is also a great amount of uh, sex education that does actually educate uh, high schoolers on uh, actual sexual activity and STDs and all of that that goes with that. Um, sex ed that is abstinence only is markedly, uh, and I say this scientifically, markedly uh, inferior. Uh, studies have shown uh, markedly that when high schools do not have uh, sex ed that is an abstinence only education, uh, those high schools have dramatically higher rates of unintended pregnancy and STDs. Uh, the thinking behind it, the justification there, uh, what we think is close to social reality is that simply a lot of teens don't know much about sex. And if they're not officially being taught about sex, they don't necessarily know how things go down. Um, m and they will figure it out through uh, one way or another, be it... Uh, having their friends tell them, or in the modern era of pornography, how sex works, but they don't know the consequences that lie therein and how to prevent those consequences. So most teens understand that when a male has sex with a female, uh, it could produce a baby, uh, but they might not necessarily understand the range of uh, sexually transmitted infections that could also be created by having sex. And it isn't helpful to tell kids just to not have sex because they will. Um, you have to tell them how to prevent getting those infections. And now let's look at this next slide. So uh, each dot represents a boy or a girl at quote unquote Jefferson High. Sociologists do this when we study things. We give them uh, fake names, uh, but we uh, maintain uh, the actual data. So anyway, this is Jefferson High uh, in the year 2004. Uh, so you will note that uh, I don't think there are any dots on this chart that link people of the same sex uh, sexually. Uh, if we did this same study 
in uh, this year, I would expect to see at least some of those up there. But what do we have? So uh, two, most of the teenagers had had just one or two sexual partners. So that is represented in that 63 uh, down here in the corner. Most of them are boy relationship with girl. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean uh, penis vagina intercourse, right? It could mean a and any of this could re mean a range of uh, sexual contact or no actual sexual contact. All we're looking at is uh, romantic relationships. And then 288 of 832 students interviewed were linked in a giant sexual network. So how does that break down? 288 students are up in here, right? And then the rest of these students are down here. And if you do the math and you add all of these up, uh, this doesn't ma add up to a total of 832. So I'm presuming that the other ones were uh, not sexually active during this uh, time period that we were interviewing, the 18 month time period. And also, they could be part of that 90 students who were in relationships outside of the school who are also not shown on this chart. So look that over. And by, we don't just study these things to, you know, be weird, creepy people that are asking teenagers about their sex lives, right? We want to know what teen sex what networks look like so that we can prevent uh, an outbreak of syphilis in a high school, for example. Syphilis isn't necessarily a disease that we talk about so much. Um, when I was younger, we talked more about AIDS because AIDS was deadlier and AIDS still is deadly. But we might talk about herpes or chlamydia, but we often ignore syphilis. And syphilis is actually an uh, STI that really is very insidious because when you first contract syphilis uh, and you aren't using proper protection, uh, you might get a sore that looks a little bit like a blister on your genitals. And most of us, when something weird happens with our genitals, we try to ignore it, don't we? Uh, but if you do that with syphilis and you ignore it, the bad thing about it is it goes away and it goes away and the whole time it's gone you and if you are sexually active you are still contagious right that's the the dangerous thing about syphilis is you are still contagious and then after about it could be a couple months it could be a couple years you might come down with something that those of us who are older would recognize as looking like chicken pox uh, if you are um, about 10 years younger than me, you probably never had chicken pox, uh, but it looks like a rash. And if you ignore, th most people now would go to the doctor, but if you ignore that, that also goes away. And maybe another couple months, maybe another couple years, you keep having unprotected sex, you keep infecting people with syphilis, then tertiary syphilis kicks in and your uh, body tissues start falling apart. Your skin falls off in chunks. You can lose a nose at this period, and that is all terrifying. And uh, the worst of all, what kills most people with syphilis is it uh, breaks down the tissues of the heart, the brain, etc. Um, it's, a, it's a wicked disease, but you know what? It can be cured with a shot of penicillin, and that's it. So, um, First of all, protect yourself, and second of all, you think you might have syphilis, go to a doctor. Um, I only mention this because actually in the city I live in, in Columbus, we are in the middle of a multi-year uh, syphilis outbreak. So I actually see that as something important to talk about, and it relates directly to adolescent sexual networks. If we don't teach kids what syphilis does, what syphilis can do, then... Um, that whole 288 students up here uh, could uh, get syphilis. Now, um, we talked about teen sex. Now let's talk about extramarital sex. When we talk about extramarital sex, we're not talking about sex 
before marriage. We're talking about people who are married who are having sex outside of their marriage. Uh, this is also known as adultery or infidelity. It involves a married person having sex with another woman or man. Uh, research shows that secrecy, tension, and guilt can make uh, this kind of sex uh, less gratifying. So my wording isn't great here. Uh, far from gratifying. Uh, basically, um, the uh, extramarital sex often has a lot of emotional baggage tied in with it, uh, which makes it not great uh, in many times. And culture often shapes extramarital sex. Uh, in American society, we do tend to still see marriage as fairly sacred, so it is seen as a big deal if a, uh, you would cheat on your spouse. Uh, in other societies, say France, for example, um, there are cultures of uh, mistresses or, um, or women having sex with men outside of marriage, too. Uh, it really varies from uh, place to place around the world. Um, in some places, it's a lot, lot worse. So a lot of places in the Middle East or in Africa, um, really serious consequences are for adultery. Uh, with that all said, uh, there is nothing against the law about having sex if you're married outside of your marriage. Uh, it is something that is largely in our society regulated by social mores, right? Uh, so, uh, a lot of times it's said that's, and it is, it's between you and your spouse if you would have marriage outside of uh, your relationship. In many relationships it ends it, but there is no actually law against it. So, who are those most likely uh, to cheat in the U.S.? Uh, those who experience premarital sex. So, if you are somebody... And all of this is not to place judgment or morality calls or anything. These are just the raw statistics, right? If you had sex before you were married, uh, you are more likely to cheat on your spouse. Not more likely than the average person, but more likely than the person that did not have sex before marriage. Um, those who are less religious are also uh, more likely to cheat on their spouse. Uh, those of lower incomes are more likely to cheat on their spouse. And those with liberal or what we could call progressive values are uh, more likely uh, to cheat on their spouse. Um, so in a lot of ways, uh, those people that are less bound by tradition, uh, you could say, are more likely to cheat on their spouse. And men are more likely uh, than women uh, to uh, cheat on their spouse. Uh, I don't have access to data on um, same-sex couples that are married to each other. Uh, so would a man in a same-sex couple be more likely than a woman who's in a same-sex couple to cheat? Um, I don't have that data. I'm not sure. Um, it would be really interesting to discuss that though. Another classification of deviant heterosexual sex are swingers. So these are couples that uh, swap spouses for sex only. And this is a phenomena that's less common than infidelity. So these are a married couple who agree, okay, we're going to have sex with other people. Um, mo a lot of sexual activity in the modern era is tied up with the internet. So the internet and sex clubs uh, allow uh, couples to uh, swing like this. Um, mostly the, the group uh, demographically that's most likely to engage in this behavior is middle class uh, suburban white people. And uh, other studies find that uh, they resort to swinging to express liberation from social control. So again, these are people that uh, desire to break out from society a little bit, right? So those middle class suburban people that feel they're being constrained by society uh, and they're breaking out from traditional social norms. So let's talk about uh, sex work. So um, first off, before I go into this, uh, and there is a discussion happening in our society now about the term sex work. Um, 
and the term prostitution. Uh, prostitution in some areas is being replaced by the term sex work. What does that mean? Well, it has been decided uh, in some academic discussions that the term prostitute is demeaning, right? That we should uh, maybe, if someone wants to sell sex and have that be their work, that maybe that's their right to do that, right? And maybe we should call them sex workers instead of prostitutes so that there isn't a stigma on them uh, to because sometimes when someone does a bad thing or sells themselves in a bad way we say oh you're nothing but a prostitute you're nothing but a whore something like that so maybe we should just call them sex workers well that is an interesting conversation to have but it also complicates this discussion uh, for instructors and for me because making pornography is also a type of sex work right so if you are selling sex right from someone that buys sex from you that's one thing if you're making pornography that's that's a different phenomena uh the short of it is uh for this conversation when i talk about sex work i'm talking about pornography i'm talking about what we traditionally call prostitution i'm talking about a couple things when i talk about prostitution i'm talking about people who sell uh their sell having sex with people for money um that was probably an overly complicated uh definition but uh you know words change and this is a uh, part of you know the fun of sociology anyway though back to pornography which is always a fun sentence to say pornography sexually explicit materials we are very familiar with pornography in our modern society aren't we uh, pornography is an eight billion a year industry uh, the effects of pornography are unclear um, there have been studies on uh, what pornography does to people some studies show that uh, pornography can be dangerous uh, particularly pornography can be dangerous uh, to those who are involved in uh, less reputable ways of making pornography such as covert filming of people that don't really consent to being in pornography or it might be damaging to uh, young people uh, when namely teenagers that develop um, you know it might in the development of their ideas of what sex is and not really understanding that pornography is a performance of sex and not really how most sex looks that could be dangerous uh, however there are some feminist uh, scholars that think that pornography can be empowering and help a woman or anyone embrace their sexuality uh, so actually feminist scholars are on both sides of the pro pornography and anti pornography argument um, others uh, say that pornography just is and it's harmless uh, the it's really kind of unclear um, it might be that since pornography has changed so much in the last generation and that it is so available that we really don't know what it's doing to our society now as with a lot of things we might know it in 10 or 15 years from now it, uh, which in the meantime can be frustrating for some people phone sex phone sex is uh, effectively the selling of a sexual fantasy and uh, inter there are a couple interesting um, elements about phone sex. Uh, sociologists have studied phone sex in great detail. Uh, it's, it's kind of on the decline, right? Because as uh, you can, uh, as with cam boys and cam girls, uh, videotape people doing uh, sexual things in real time, uh, there isn't really necessarily a need for phone sex anymore. But there are still people that do it, so they call up the phone sex line, they uh, get charged by the minute to do the phone sex line, and um, the goal of the phone sex operator is to make that thing last as long as possible, right? So they, they might uh, sexually tease the, um, the caller, things like that. 
but it's it's largely becoming a thing of the past. Uh, the modern version of phone sex are uh, cam boys and cam girls. These are people that use internet videos to um, interact sexually with people, sometimes uh, multiple people, uh, maybe a whole lot of people all at once. And this is often interactive and it is also uh, by pay. It could be by the minute. It could be by the, um, you know, the act or whatever. Uh, more things about phone sex. Uh, there are five different types of uh, phone sex people. And again, this is because sociologists have studied this in detail. We've identified these things. We know less about uh, cam boys and cam girls because it's a newer phenomena. Uh, as, far, as far as phone sex, there are quick sex callers who ask for a quick sex act. There are violent and angry callers that it's thought they just either want to yell at somebody or um, that's kind of the sexual fantasy that person has. There are lonely callers that call up and want the same operator and maybe they just want to talk which is interesting. There are sexually progressive callers who, uh, and that's a slightly uh, confusing term, basically these are people that want to try to form a relationship with their phone sex operator which is interesting. And there are likable, likable callers that are actually become likable to the phone sex operator and are able to raise an operator's interest. And much like a lot of sex workers, the vast majority of people that they interact with are not actually sexually interesting to them. But every once in a while, there is somebody. Another type of sex work is nude dancing, stripping, if you will. Um, this is another version of delivering a sexual fantasy, and actually some dancers do earn a good wage, uh, like any business, right? There is low end, there is the McDonald's of the thing, and then there's the fancy steakhouse of the thing, right? And uh, nude dancing and stripping is the same way. Uh, many do not consider their work to be disreputable, right? There are sociological and feminist studies that uh, make the argument that stripping can be um, empowering to women. Uh, often, with that said, many uh, strippers do hide how they earn making money, uh, but some find it empowering. And also tied in with that, not all strippers, not all nude dancers uh, also will perform sexual acts, but some will, right? Because this whole thing is in the realm of disreputable and deviant things so it might be another couple steps uh, for somebody to uh, perform sex acts as well now let's talk about prostitution the thing that is sometimes called sex work the simple definition of uh, prostitution is the exchange of sex for money uh, and this actually I forgot I put these bullets in here this is to explain why we replace uh, sex work with prostitution. Uh, it validates the work to call prostitution sex work. It empowers women, uh, but it could uh, confuse our conversations about the term. Uh, and that's a good point. I, I'm, I'm glad I put that in there. I do encourage you to call prostitutes sex workers. I think that is probably a good thing for our society. It's just confusing for the conversations that we're having in class. So we do have some uh, sociological theories as to how prostitution works. There are functionalist theories which state that a system of morality causes prostitution to exist as a social institution, right? So there's prostitution and some people just can't get sex other ways, right? So maybe the existence of prostitution helps that to work and also by prostitutes existing it helps other people feel more virtuous and feel more moral about the sex that they have. Uh, there are feminist theories about prostitution that a patriarchal system encourages prostitution by creating a demand and a supply for it, right? So there are male dominated entities in our society that say we must have we men 
must have sex no matter what and it must be available to us thus it creates a demand for people who want to buy sex Uh, there are multiple types of prostitutions. Uh, there are street walkers who solicit, solicit customers on the street. So this is the, the lowest end generally of prostitutes. Uh, this is also the type of prostitute that is most likely to be working independently. Uh, but street walkers are often uh, tied to pimps as well. We'll talk about it in a second. There are child and adolescent prostitutes. Uh, Teenagers or other uh, young prostitutes who are in their early 20s are most likely to be the victims of human, human trafficking or uh, uh, sla modern day slavery basically. There are prostitutes who work in brothels and they are the prostitutes that are most likely to be legal prostitutes as in the state of Nevada and some other places they uh, might be working legally. And then there are call girls who use answering services to make uh, calls. So um, sometimes if you live in an urban area and if you pick up a free newspaper, there will be ads in the back of that free newspaper for these uh, companion services. Those are the types of prostitutes that uh, we call call girls. The social and sexual backgrounds of prostitutes are more normal than many people believe. Um, you know, if you live in a urban area, maybe even a rural area, you might know uh, or have a prostitute in your circles, right? Uh, prostitutes exist. There are prostitutes and they, they live in the world. Um, the most common reason for becoming a prostitute, a prostitute is economic, right? So... Uh, most people who just got going into any business, when they sell sex, uh, they do it because they want to make money. And uh, the threat of disease is uh, greater for those who sell sex uh, in uh, poorer countries because in poorer countries uh, there isn't as much education about how sex works uh, and how STDs work. So customers often refuse to wear condoms in those countries. Uh, in the United States, most often prostitutes uh, require uh, their clients to wear condoms. There are uh, some other terms that we use referring to prostitution. A madam uh, can be referred to as the owner or manager of a brothel. Um, I don't know what the male term for the owner or manager of a brothel is. If it's a lady, I know it's a madam. I'm not, it might just be owner. Um, a pimp is the street manager of prostitutes so who would manage uh, street walkers uh, and a John is the prosti the prostitutes customer um, one marked thing about John's is that they rarely are the ones that get the charges when people when um, there are sting operations to catch people who are selling sex in areas where it's illegal it's almost always the prostitute that gets the uh, charge and not the person buying sex um, which you know you can also talk about as far as uh, power dynamics between men and women and patriarchy holding up uh, sex work okay good uh, that is the end of this lecture and I look forward to our discussions in the discussion boards